Hello and welcome. My name is Fabian Voigt. Although I'm currently doing a postdoc in the US, uh, I will talk to you today about a project that I've been carrying out in the lab of my former PI, Fritjof Helmchen at the University of Zurich. And this project is going to be about mollusk-inspired multi-immersion microscope objectives, which sounds a bit like a strange title, but let's jump right into it. So the challenge I'm addressing here is the question of how can we design better objectives for imaging clear tissue. And imaging clear tissue is a hard problem because currently we have such a wide range of different index, uh, indices for immersion media that published clearing techniques cover. So for example, for expansion microscopy, samples usually need to be imaged at an index of 1.33 or in water, whereas for organic solvent techniques, uh, oftentimes we're imaging in, in, with indices of 1.56. And even though this is only part of, for instance, what glass types cover, this is actually a pretty gigantic index range to properly correct uh, microscope objectives for. And as a result, existing microscope objectives to cover at least part of this range are very expensive. So here's an example of an Olympus objective, which has NA 0.6, eight millimeter working distance. Um, but but it actually only goes up to index 1.51. And so the question is, well, how can we combine um, large field of view imaging, so ideally more than a millimeter, and A so above 1.7, and large working distance, so let's say more than a centimeter, uh, and also arrive at a microscope objective design that is capable of imaging in all media. And in order to kind of provide you a few hints of how my solution for this problem uh, is going to work, I have to reacquaint you with geometrical optics a little bit. So I guess a lot of people in optics and microscopy are familiar with the law of refraction. So a ray changes its direction upon hitting an interface between diff two different media with re different refractive indices. There is a corner case here, and this corner case is if you're at normal incidence, so the ray goes straight at 90 degree incidence angle onto the interface, there is no refraction occurring at all. So the ray, uh, the direction is undisturbed uh, after the interface. And this may seem like a completely, well, boring kind of uh, corner case. However, there's something interesting about it. And that is, if you're at normal incidence and then change the uh, medium uh, on, of, of one of the, uh, on one of the sides, then you will actually see that the ray still passes through without any change. And in a very similar vein, if you talk, take the law of reflection and you have a ray bouncing off a mirror where the angle of incidence equals the angle of the reflection. Also here, if you change the medium, <clears throat> And the bulk index of the medium that the mirror is in touch with, the refraction, uh, reflection is not going to change. And um, so this is kind of, you know, illustrating how the solution is going to work. But the actual inspiration for the for the addressing this problem came about from uh, something you're going to see here. So here you can see a diver diving along. And at some point, well, there's a scallop. And fascinatingly, the scallop escapes, is kind of swimming along, wiggling a little bit, and then it's going to, um, you know, settle on the ocean floor. And what you've seen here is that scallops actually have vision, which might come uh, to uh, sound surprising, uh, given that uh, they, you know, seem like boring mollusks. However, their sense of vision is actually, actually quite fascinating. Namely, instead of having just two eyes like we do, they have lots of eyes. And you can see the eyes being the blue little beautiful cup-shaped protrusions that are along the mantle. And if we zoom in on those, they're going to look like uh, this. And uh, what is fascinating about them that at first sight, they might look like the eyes we have. However, if you were to take a histological section through these eyes, you will see, well, yes, there is a lens. And well, yes, there is a, a retina. However, the primary um, image forming element in this uh, eye design is actually a spherical mirror, which do, does most of the focusing. So what the scallop is doing is exploiting this idea of having a mirror in contact with the liquid medium because the space between lens and mirror is actually filled with the, with the liquid um, in order to form a sharp image. And uh, this is a concept, if you look at this design kind of from an optical point of from an optical design point of view, that is actually very familiar to somebody uh, who's been doing a little bit of work in touch with astronomers. And that is something called the Schmidt telescope. In order to illustrate what a Schmidt telescope is, I'm going to show you this video. Um, so this is an animation of Malashi showing a spherical mirror, and we have a few rays bouncing off the spherical mirror. And as you can see, well, there's horrible spherical aberration. The ray 
they simply do not come to a common focus. And in the 1930s, there was a guy named Bernhard Schmidt who figured out a way to compensate for that. And that is by placing a so-called correction plate in front of the mirror. And this correction plate has a, a spherical surface. So this is this weird, you know, very thick in the center and then thinner at the edges. And this counteracts the spherical aberration of the mirror. And in the end, we will have a very, very good image quality over an image surface, which is, uh, has a bit of curvature, which is coming from the uh, symmetry or the rotational symmetry of the uh, spherical mirror. And now we could turn this thing into a Schmidt uh, microscope, so to say, by taking this design and then uh, immersing the rear half of it into a um, you know, submersion liquid. However, you see there's a problem with that. And the problem is, well, although the mirror doesn't introduce additional aberrations when we do this, there is additional refraction occurring at the interface between the correction plate and the uh, liquid medium. And as a result, we still suffer from spherical aberration. And so this thing would be pretty useless as an immersion microscope objective as it is. However, it is possible to compensate for this problem by taking this inner surface and then deforming it in a very special way. And namely, we're going to deform it so that all the passing rays are locally at normal incidence. So you can see here, all these rays are at normal incidence. The rays just go straight through without additional refraction. And in other words, what this means is that the um, uh, surface is shaped exactly like the passing wavefront. So this wavefront propagates from the glass medium into the liquid medium uh, pretty much undisturbed. And this is what you're going to see here. So this way we recover ideally diffraction limited imaging conditions and also uh, over a large field of view. And this works in air, in, uh, and we can also fill the system with a completely different immersion liquid, and we will still have basically the same ray path, and thus we will still retain very, very good image quality. And similarly to a Schmidt telescope, the uh, focal surface of such a design is curved, and so we can have a curved surface uh, in here. Now, this is what the concept of the microscope looks like. Um, in the real thing that we've put together actually looks a bit more like this. So we take a correction plate, we take a mirror, and then we put everything in a chamber. We put a sample in between, ideally a cleared sample, and then we fill this chamber with an immersion liquid. We, and we can then integrate this design into a to photo microscope, which is basically super similar to completely standard to photo microscopes, with the only difference being that the system is horizontal instead of vertical or um, um, upright or inverted. And so we have some Galvo scanners scanning the beam, and then we have a combination of a scan and tube lens, which is expanding the beam uh, to inject it into the uh, microscope objective. And the emitted fluorescence from the two-photon excitation is then caught by the mirror and reflected back uh, in, towards the uh, excitation path. And then we have a dichroic inner detection system with a few photomultipliers, completely comparable to a normal two-photon microscope. And so this is what the actual cross-section of the optical design looks like. So you see it roughly has an aperture of 22 millimeters. And this system operates as a, a multi-immersion Schmidt uh, microscope objective with a numerical aperture of 0.69 in air. And then the numerical aperture increases uh, towards uh, higher and higher indices up to 1.08 at an index of 1.56. And so let me walk you through a variety of features the system has. So firstly, we've optimized it for multi-photon imaging because um, in, in, for instance, when using a single titanium sapphire for illumination with these typical parameters, it's much easier to do color correction and, uh, than, uh, for instance, for designing a system for confocal or light sheet imaging. And in order to demonstrate this prototype, we therefore opted for uh, building a multi photon version first. Secondly, as you can see, the numerical aperture increases uh, linearly with the refractive index. And also, um, the system has the property that the product of numerical aperture and field of view is constant. And then the field of view actually um, shrinks with increasing numerical aperture. And so this means that we always have a, a diffraction limited field of view bigger than a millimeter. But in air, this is much bigger than, for instance, in, uh, in this case, ECI or Thu Cinemat at an index of 1.56. This focal surface is curved with a radius of roughly 15 millimeters. Um, this means in practical terms that for a field of view that has 400 micron diameter, uh, zones that are at the very edge of the field of view will be out of, uh, you know, to have a change in focal shift of two micron compared to um, 
uh, zones at the center of the field of view. And this is usually not a problem in cleared samples. Uh, the working distance is approximately 11 millimeters. Of course, in this design, one can discuss a little bit how one defines working distance. In this case, it's just a mechanical distance we can move before we hit the mirror with the um, with a larger and extended sample. And as I pointed out, any homogeneous medium works. And obviously, the sample partially blocks the optical path, both in the excitation and detection path. However, we found this is totally acceptable up to sample sizes of six by six millimeters. And this is what the objective looks like in real life. So very similar to the animation you saw before, it's a, it's a chamber. The correction plate sits here on the left, is integrated into this chamber, and these windows here on the, on the, on the sides are simply for observation. They're not for light sheet excitation or the like. The sample is then inserted here using this 3D printed sample holder, and this holder here uh, carries the mirror. And if you then take this objective and uh, image, uh, try to do resolution measurements or point spread function measurements with uh, fluorescent beads, you will see that if you increase the refractive index, uh, your point spread function size shrinks as you expect when you have higher and higher resolution at different numerical apertures. And very importantly for this home built objective, its resolution is actually within 10 to 15% of um, the theoretically diffraction limited value, which uh, is totally acceptable and the uh, difference is probably due to alignment and manufacturing tolerances. So if you were to see such PSS from a commercial microscope objective, you wouldn't, uh, you know, would say, you would classify this as a pretty good objective. Now, we can take now this objective and uh, do a variety of imaging tests with it. And one example is that we take a, a, a bunch of dried pollen. So this is a grain of grain, so to say. Each of these little dots is an individual pollen grain, and they've been dried together to form a kind of larger grain. And we can do a, a overview, um, in this case, imaging autofluorescence with a mesospin light sheet microscope to just generate a basic overview of what the sample looks like, what the topography is in order to select Roy for imaging at higher resolution. And then within this overview data set, after transferring the sample to our multi immersion Schmidt objective, we can then image at higher and higher zoom. And you can see then at some point, you will see nicely the surface features of the, uh, these poem um, resolved. But however, unlike a normal air objective, we can now fill it with a uh, index matching medium, for instance, deep into ether, for, as used in the iDisco protocol. And then we can take a cleared sample, in this case, a mouse brain immersed in iDisco, a pro processed using iDisco, and immersed in DBE at an index of 1.56, and image individual neurons like this layer five, layer five pyramidal neuron in the mouse cortex. And if we zoom in and in, we see at some point we had a resolution level where we can easily resolve individual spines which are the uh, postsynaptic compartment that is receiving information from other uh, parts of the brain in this case. Now, uh, for me, it was one of the really amazing things about this project that using this very, very simplistic objective, which only contains three optical surfaces, recall there's two surfaces in the uh, correction plate and one spherical mirror, in order to you know, achieve an imaging quality like this, where again, you wouldn't be able to tell that it was generated using a home-built microscope objective. Uh, another example is that we can image a, a you know, whole uh, organism. In this case, this is a Cynopus tadpole, which is a couple of days old. And then in this case, we're taking a mesospin overview, so a light sheet overview of low resolution. Here you can see a gray uh, nuclei stained with DAPI, and then we have an antibody stain against part of the peripheral nervous system, and we can transfer the sample to the Schmidt objective and image it much, much higher resolution. We can visualize this data set in uh, 3D, and you can see this was done with a single stack with a field of view of a little uh, um, slightly below a millimeter and we can within this larger data set then for instance place a um, and select a subregion for scanning at higher resolution and so here we selected one of the eyes and we can nicely generate in this case in a digital section through the uh, through this uh, eye where you can see the developing layers of the retina and the developing eye plus developing uh, photoreceptors in orange and all of this is done in the uh, in this complete sample, which in this case is roughly five millimeters long. So this is basically multimodal imaging using both the mesospin light microscope and the Schmidt uh, microscope objective. 
But because it's a multi-immersion objective, we can also image live samples. So in this case, this is a zebrafish larva imaged in uh, water. So this was just a stick showing the brain, and then we can select a, a ROI for calcium imaging and high frame rates. And then you know we can see the neural activity, in this case, imaged with the calcium indicator GCAM6F. And we then can recover nice, uh, you know, very standard calcium transients, similar to what you could do with the standard um, water uh, immersion objective. So to summarize what I've shown you today is that basically you can literally, uh, you know, pick an idea out of the ocean, sprinkle in some know-how from astronomy, combine it with this uh, modern uh, plethora of clearing techniques in order to arrive at a new way of how one can design microscope objectives. And if I can only leave you with one thought at the end, um, it is that uh, Actually, this project beyond its you know, multi-immersion capabilities, it illustrates that actually there's a lot of unexplored design space. You know, there's a lot of stuff where we can use very, very traditional geometrical optics to come up with new ways of um, designing microscope objectives. With this, I'm at the end. I would like to thank you for your attention. And especially, I would like to thank everybody involved, especially my former supervisor, Friedrich Helmchen, for uh, all the support and uh, all the other people who provided um, <clears throat> samples to image. In the case of Lesh Whitehead, created all the animations that you saw. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>